Welcome to the Identity Management webinar. Uh, just get into some introductions first of all. My name's Gabriel Smith. I'm a uh, solution architect here at Intigen. I've, I've been here um, for 11 years, uh, which is a long time. Uh, my background is in uh, software development. Um, and I, I've, throughout that time uh, as a software developer, I've, I've always had a strong interest uh, around security and identity. Uh, and um, over my time at Intigen, I've been involved in a number of sort of identity related uh, projects um, in, in various government sectors. Um, that's enough about me. Damien, uh, tell us a little about you. Uh, so my name is Damien Morgan. I'm a senior infrastructure consultant here at Intigen also. I've uh, been with Intigen for just over three years now, um, mostly working in our hosting environments and uh, consulting around um, various infrastructure deployments um, with a keen focus on ADFS deployments for various uh, Microsoft-based solutions, including Dynamics CRM and SharePoint. Cool. Thanks, Dan. Uh, just talking over our agenda we have for today, uh, we're going to be covering just, you know, really what is identity, uh, some of the common challenges we uh, face around dealing with identity, uh, and along with that identity integration. Um, we're going to explain this concept of federation, uh, which is one thing <coughs> hopefully understand a lot more about it through this uh, webinar. Uh, we're going to talk about some New Zealand specific identity uh, projects and scenarios, uh, and then we're going to go through uh, the, the main sort of uh, Microsoft um, products that they have available to help us um, deal with some of these identity uh, um, challenges we face. And finally, we'll um, wrap up and, and have some questions. So um, let's jump on into it. So what is identity? And really, when I say identity, uh, we all know kind of who we are. Uh, but really, what we're talking about is digital identity. And uh, really, this is the, the, the data that uniquely describes a person um, or a thing and, and these associated attributes. Uh, so we'll talk about that uh, in, in more detail later. Uh, and there's these concepts of uh, authentication, uh, which is kind of essentially kind of proving um, who you are. Like you know, uh, you're making a making some claim, like you know, I am Gabriel Smith, and it's providing some proof to, to back that up. So that that's the, the definition of authentication, and, and I guess a really popular um, form of that is a username and a password. Uh, and then there's this concept of authorization, and that's kind of well, given that we know who you are, it's like well, what can you do? Um, and so the fact of the matter is, these days, is that we actually have many uh, digital identities. Um, I think last time I kind of counted, a, I have about 40 to 50 digital identities that I actively use. You know, we've got internet banking, Microsoft Live IDs, uh, Azure IDs, Facebook, Facebook account, yeah. Google accounts. So, um, and, uh, you know, this, um, I guess over the last 10 or 20 years, you know, the, the amount of digital identities we're managing it just seems to be going up, and um, so so clearly there needs to be some some way to kind of um, help manage that better. Uh, and and so um, some of these identity management solutions are, are, are really trying to address um, some of some of those challenges out there. So the the, the common uh, challenges we we face uh, as sort of IT practitioners. Uh, is that the, the, the main IT trends that are sort of influencing us is we've got, um, you know, mobile, bring your own device, you know, so we've got people that are um, in organisations that are kind of bringing in their own devices, um, you know, how they manage their security, they're, they're hooked up to all sorts of um, services out there, uh, as, as well as um, company internal systems, and, and, and you know, mobile's really um, been hugely successful, but it, you know, it sort of represents, a, I guess, it's another influence in, in um, causing challenges around how organisations manage identity. And, and essentially the users of these systems. Um, we obviously got the, the, the cloud um, movement and, and software as a service, infrastructure as a service. And, and really what this sort of represents is uh, traditional workloads that are, uh, are being uh, managed and provided sort of uh, through an in-house IT uh, function are now you know, moving towards um, these being uh, outsourced or provided by a service provider over the internet. And so the, the uh, that the boundaries or the traditional boundaries of identity or organizational identity are really getting blurred, you know, and that the IT systems that are delivering your now internal systems are uh, being delivered um, across the internet um, from far off places uh, around the world. And so uh, the need to manage identity uh, 
much better, you know, is really just increasing. Um, I guess with that as well, there, there's been some sort of increasingly high profile um, cases of, you know, information privacy and, and uh, where information has been um, breached. And, and so th th this just kind of further highlights, you know, the need to manage um, security uh, really comprehensively and, and using good, good systems and processes. So as uh, software developers and, and uh, sort of IT practitioners, uh, we always we have a sort of challenge of, you know, when we're dealing with applications uh, or services that we're providing, you know, how, how do we authenticate users? And, uh, and the kind of traditional approaches to how we've done this, um, applications have typically been bound to a uh, Active Directory or, a, you know, an LDAP uh, user store. Uh, and some database, uh, some applications would use a database um, to achieve a similar thing. Uh, now, some of the challenges we, we've had with that is that it's it's really hard to integrate um, applications that are hosted in different locations uh, together. Um, so, so they're you know authenticating users against a, a, a you know a, a common set of users, or it could be a different set of users from different organisations. And uh, so, you know, applications have been built to date using this kind of slightly hardwired approach where we're just saying we're going to look at one source of identity uh, store. Uh, but really new applications these days are, are, are what need to be built in what we call a claims-based approach. And it, it, what that sort of really means is that the, um, the application needs to use uh, some standards uh, to make um, how it, it actually identifies and authorizes a user a, a pluggable component of an application. Uh, and so there's some standards uh, and frameworks uh, uh, around that help um, make this happen. So there's um, the security assertion markup language, which uh, is referred to as SAML 2.0. Uh, and there's this concept of um, federation and web single sign-on, uh, which all help um, to achieve this. And in the Microsoft space, when we're dealing with bespoke applications, there's the uh, what's called the Windows Identity Foundation, which is a a, uh, a technology stack that helps enable uh, this happen from an application developer's uh, point of view. So it's um, helping make uh, life easier for uh, for developers who are building apps um, that need to be uh, claims based, use claims based security. I suppose another key thing here is that this is also making it easier for your users. So through through things like um, SAML2 Federation, we have SSO. Users can have a single username and password that that provides them access to multiple different applications um, that may or may not be hosted within your own LAN environment. Um, so just you know, you means your users aren't having to remember you know, ten different passwords for ten different applications. Yeah, thanks, Damien. I uh, always get a bit excited about the technology, and uh, <laughs> important not to forget the users there. Yeah, there's, there are benefits associated with this. Um, so just to dig into this uh, this concept of federation uh, a little bit further is that we, we talk about this uh, thing uh, of a claim and uh, just up in this uh, corner here we have this is trying to illustrate uh, a claim and really what it is it's a it's a uh, it's a fragment of information um, typically it's communicated in a, an XML uh, sort of document and so it could contain things such as you know like your name your role your age uh, maybe your email address that, that type of stuff. And so a, a bunch of um, attributes, identity attributes, we'll call them. And then finally, that's signed. And it's, it's signed by a, uh, a, an authority uh, that has released this information. And, and so uh, when we go and look over this uh, scenario over here, where we have a, a user that's, say, using a web browser, they're going to go and uh, say that they want to go and use a, a service, that they want to um, authenticate themselves. It could be that they are... Uh, they go to this thing called a security token service, um, an STS for short. And so this security token service, all it does is it exchanges uh, tokens. So it could be in this example that it goes to the security token service and uh, they could provide a username and a password to the security token service. Uh, the security token service will then go and check that in a uh, directory. We could just say for argument's sake, this is an active directory in this case. Uh, and then goes, okay, that user is authenticated. And then what it's going to return is a token, which is a, a, this thing we're talking about over here. And so the token is just basically saying, we've authenticated this user, um, here's some details about them, uh, and, and that token has been signed 
by the security security token service. So that's um that's a first step in the process, just explaining claims and what a security token service is. Let's um let's start mixing it up a bit. So in this scenario, we've we've actually got an application or a service that the user is wanting to access. Um, so what what would typically happen is that a user would go to use that service. Uh, they're not authenticated. They'll get pushed over to a security token service, and they'll be asked to authenticate themselves. So again, uh, provide username and password, get back a token. That token is then presented to the application, and because the token has been signed uh, and it is trusted by this application. So that there's been a, 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 a trust has been established out of band uh, through configuration prior in the process. The application is able to take those attributes and and use them to uh, you know work out who the user is and what they can do. And so the cool thing about this is that the application actually uh, all it all it says is I need to have an authenticated user with some information from a security token service that I trust, but I don't really need to know the details as to how and uh, you know the, the exact mechanisms as to how that identity has been established. I just need to know that I, I trust that issuer. And, and so what this means is you can kind of start to uh, expand the way uh, identity is, um, is determined uh, beyond just your application's capabilities. So let's um, start looking at some other scenarios. So in this scenario, uh, the, the, the uh, actual identity has been uh, brokered. Um, so we've still got an application, uh, but here what we have is a uh, we've got a, a piece in the middle which is called a, a federation provider, and this is acting as a kind of like a, a middle person which is brokering the transaction. So uh, a user will go to use an application, they'll get sent back to a broker. The broker is saying you need to go and work out your identity. Eventually they'll get back to uh, their own security token service, they prove their identity, goes back to the broker, and then finally they get directed back to the application. So with this scenario is that the application only needs to trust the broker, and then from the broker we can actually expand out to a number of um, security token services. So this is this is pretty powerful in that you could actually start to expand the number of uh, just say organisations uh, that you could Authenticate with, or it could be you add in Facebook um, authentication, or uh, um, you know other other forms of, of identity. So, but from the application's point of view, nothing's changed. That's a pretty powerful concept, and it, that, that, this overall concept uh, is called federation. Um, here's a, a, a business to business scenario where we've got two organisations uh, X and Y, uh, and so one organisation uh, Y is providing an application that users from organization X uh, can use. Um, so just for argument's sake, this will be available on the internet. So uh, a user goes to use the application, they're told they need to authenticate, uh, they'll, they'll get uh, directed to a security token service initially and uh, they'll be given a choice as to how they want to authenticate. They'll eventually get directed back to their own organization's security token service. Uh, and uh, if this user um, happened to be working inside its network, it's actually possible uh, with uh, the Microsoft infrastructure, just, just say this was using uh, Active Directory Federation services, which it happens to be here, that the user could actually be automatically authenticated here. They get back a token. Uh, the, the, the token is then presented back to the security token service, exchanged for another token, and then finally they can actually use the application. And from the application's perspective, it is, uh, it's dealing with a, a user that has a token that has uh, been issued from a security token service that the application trusts. So, so a real world application of something like this may be um, you, you, one business wants to open up a portion of their SharePoint um, intranet to uh, a partner business to allow collaboration. So we can set up um, a, a nice pass-through authentication to allow that to happen. Yeah, cool. And so these scenarios can just uh, keep on going. Um, here, here's a sort of a, a cloud scenario where uh, a user within an organisation is using a, uh, a cloud service. Um, this could be, for argument's sake, uh, Office 365, for example. Um, they'll, they'll need authentication. They'll go back to an ADFS server get a token, token gets presented back, 
And so in this scenario, uh, a user within their own organization is able to use Office 365 using their own internal um, Active Directory credentials. So they wouldn't actually need to put a, provide a username and password. So, um, and that's called like a, a web SSO scenario. Uh, just moving on again, another cloud-based scenario is where uh, if you have an application that's being deployed into the Azure environment, Azure provides a, uh, a service, a, 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 effectively a brokering service uh, the, called uh, ACS, Access Control Service. And uh, this is a, an environment where you're able to configure um, your application to, to work with a number of uh, sort of established identity providers. Um, examples of these are um, Live ID, uh, Facebook, um, and, uh, and others. Um, but with this particular example, it, it's actually been configured to work with an organization ADFS server. So again, uh, like with the previous example, um, the user is able to use this application in the cloud uh, using the credentials from their own internal Active Directory uh, without needing to um, type in the username and password again. So it's, it's the same identity uh, that's being managed. And so with this infrastructure, we're, we're able to provide these um, these scenarios and uh, you know the, the real advantage under this scenario is that um, you know say say using a you know cloud-based uh, services if you don't you know federate your identities with your internal organization out to your cloud-based applications you know when you when you get a scenario of uh, an employee who uh, doesn't work for you anymore you know if you don't um, integrate your identity when that employee leaves you know and, and if you don't have a, an offboarding process that actually Make sure they don't have access to this application anymore. Uh, you know the, the very real risk is uh, when they left your organisation, they've still got access to, say, your CRM um, database, uh, which is provided online. So you know it, it's um, this federation not only makes it sort of easier for people to sign on, but it's just much easier for you as an organisation to to manage those um, digital identities. You know, not not letting uh, those identities kind of be duplicated out there um, through the various um, applications. So just jumping into some um, New Zealand scenarios of identity projects, uh, we have the, the Realme Logon and Verified Identity Service. Um, now this has actually been around for a while. Uh, it was previously known as the iGov uh, Government Logon Service and Identity Verification Service. Uh, and at around about July this year, it, uh, it went through a, a rebranding process uh, to be called uh, Realme. And a really interesting thing uh, that also happened is that it's actually um, opened up to the private sector uh, to use it as well. Uh, and so this, the, the Realme service uh, provides um, two, two main services. There's a, a logon service, which is just literally um, where a user will uh, use a, a username and password or a, uh, even a, a stronger strength um, form of authentication, such as a, a um, an RSA token or a uh, mobile phone text uh, to authenticate themselves to to a uh, application, uh, but it also provides this thing called the uh, the verified identity service, which is really interesting. It, it, it's like it's the online equivalent of presenting your passport um, over the counter. So it's a um, it's a it's a highly trusted uh, transaction uh, for, where an organisation can verify someone's an individual's true identity, as in um, their their name, um, uh, age, and place of birth, uh, and I think it's also gender, uh, to to an organisation over the internet. So, um, w w with this process, they need to uh, establish a, and have their identity verified in advance. But then, organisations that are, are actually using the uh, verified identity service are able to ascertain someone's true identity to a, to a high level of trust uh, over the internet, which is a, a pretty powerful concept um, when, when you're wanting to do things like, say, uh, apply for a bank account online. Uh, uh, now um, banks are required with the anti-money laundering uh, legislation changes to um, take necessary sort of steps to verify someone's identity uh, when they're going to create an account online. And, and obviously from a bank's perspective, they want an account, you know, the, the process of creating a bank account to be uh, really easy for people. So um, being able to do this all online without having to go into a branch and prove your identity uh, is a really powerful concept. So um, that's, that's interesting. And, and yeah, the interesting thing around July this year, around the rebranding, was that this was being opened up um, to, be, to go beyond just um, government agencies using it to 
um, private sector organisations. And uh, I've been involved in a, in a, in a number of um, iGov and, and Realme um, integrations over the years, and it's uh, it is a it is a really interesting thing. It's just going to I think just gain a lot more momentum, um, particularly with these uh, software as a service style um, delivery of, of systems. Another one uh, dealing with um, sort of specialised government sectors is uh, in the education sector. There's the ESA system, which is a education. Um, Education sector authentication and authorization service. Uh, th so this provides um, authentication and authorization um, for for um, basically uh, staff uh, members um, who work in the education sector. So, um, so example, teachers uh, and, and um, people who work in universities that need to access uh, education sector resources online. Uh, that they have a central point of authentication and authorization, and, and this. Um, carries extra um, attribute data such as uh, the organisations they work for. It's, it's quite commonplace in the education sector where there are people that work for a number of organisations and so um, some of the access models they have to applications are, are not um, typically straightforward. And so uh, this is an example of a, um, of a, a subsector solution uh, where, where they, they have a centralised service um, to, to uh, achieve that, solve that problem. Um, in the health sector, there is also talk of a, of a similar um, service uh, in, in the planning, um, and this is where uh, potentially patients and uh, health sector staff are able to uh, authenticate and authorise themselves. Um, patients and uh, most staff have a NH, NHI number, and so it's possible that uh, using this information that uh, we could provide services uh, in, the, in the future. There, there could be an identity solution uh, similar to uh, ESA, where uh, both health staff and potentially patients uh, could um, prove their identity online and get access to services. Um, you know, it could be uh, things like um, checking appointments or checking test results, various things like that. So, uh, and enabling us to do kind of things that have otherwise been, you know, uh, somewhat challenging. You know, obviously in the, in the health sector. Um, Managing people's um, information uh, responsibly and, and and actually making sure you're dealing with the right individual uh, are really you know important things. And so um, having a shared piece of infrastructure, which is where is sort of something like Realme comes in. That if <coughs> with the the, the new identity um, view coming out of health is if we can hook into something like Realme, that means patients can then prove who they are. Um, quite easily without having to reinvent the wheel with, so health doesn't have to go out and um, create a system for, for patients to be able to prove who they are. That system already exists. So because that's standards based using SAML 2.0, we can reuse that, that system that's already there to provide that service. Yeah, thanks, Sam. Um, Another one is uh, with the all of government uh, initiatives um, from the, the GCIO is really there's been a, a directive to you know um, provide government services in a more efficient way and and uh, and um, sharing resources you know to achieve uh, good sort of you know outcomes for the taxpayer of New Zealand. Uh, so there there are a number of initiatives um, in, in which uh, sort of this idea of shared services are, are, are being promoted. Um, and there's a number of examples of this. Um, one recent one uh, that people may have heard of is uh, there. There is a uh, recent one Intigen has just released called Cohesion, where that provides a software as a service records management service, uh, and that's a shared service, um, and it's uh, using uh, SharePoint. And so, with just this particular example, uh, where as a part of that service, it actually provides the ability to federate your organisation's identity with the service, and, and uh, obviously. If you're using a, um, a, a document management system or a records management system, uh, you know users within your organisation uh, obviously want to be able to use that uh, seamlessly and securely, uh, but uh, in a way where they don't need to type in their um, their, their local network uh, username and password every time they go to use it. So um, this is a just one example of what will be many uh, more things where uh, services are being provided um, to a number of agencies. Using common uh, technology platforms, where it's been provided through a software as a service model, uh, and, and so this is something we see uh, will be um, increasingly popular uh, over time. And this is uh, the point where I'm going to hand over to Damien. 
Okay, to talk so, about Microsoft so, technology in particular. Yeah, so um, for the second part of the, the presentation, we're just going to go through some of the uh, various tools that Microsoft provides that enable us to manage identities um, within our organizations and to project those identities out um, outside of our organizations. So to start off, we're just going to have a look at um, Forefront Identity Manager. So Forefront um, basically provides us with tools to manage our users' identities within our organization. So um, onboarding and offboarding of users are simplified through, through uh, rules, through the uh, Forefront process. Um, there's connectors for connecting out to things like your HR systems. Um, and other applications so that uh, user accounts can be automatically provisioned and uh, deprovisioned. And it also provides some user self-service type tools for uh, things like um, distribution group membership and self-password self reset. Um, there's also uh, some quite good reporting and certificate management for public and private um, certificates within your organization, as well as smart cards for, for increased security. So we'll just have a look at the components that make up FIM. So starting with FIM clients, so we have things like an Outlook plugin for that allows you to um, manage many things like uh, your distribution group memberships. Um, there's a portal which is based on SharePoint, which provides users access to do a lot of the things um, that they need, that they would normally need to call a service desk for. So that's requesting access to distribution groups. Uh, managers can, of those distribution groups, have the ability to uh, accept or reject uh, access requests to those distribution groups. And users can also set up their own um, challenge questions for password to, to be able to set, reset their own password if, if they forget it. Uh, the next component area is the FIM web service under the here is which is part of the IDM platform or identity management platform. So the FIM web service basically provides a, a request pipeline and which processes a request through workflows that, that can be configured um, and largely controls what happens within the FIM, FIM service itself. The FIM service or FIM synchronization service and the FIM database um, then communicate with the various identity stores or connected data sources through through management agents or adapters that, that are created for uh, things like your Exchange system, um, Active Directory, different databases, and you, you can also create custom adapters if, if required. Um, and the last component is the certificate management component, uh, which which stores and manages your internal and public um, certificates and provides also smart card management for uh, issuing and, and deactivating smart cards if, if you require that, that level of security within your organization. Um, the types of identity stores that uh, FIM can interact with um, is, is pretty much anything that has a database. Um, so. There could be SQL databases, which might sit behind your, your HR system or, or a, an ERP system, um, various applications that, that may have a database, and directories such as Active Directory and Exchange. So just as an example of, of the sort of things that, that FIM can do. So here we have a, a user who's um, Change roles and being promoted to a to a regional finance manager. So that that requires that the users' uh, security groups need to be changed. Their um, some of the attributes of their Active Directory need to be changed, such as um, you know their title, etc. And they need to now have an account in the company's ERP system so that they can 
Doing your job. So how this would work is that your HR department would make this change in, in the HR system and the FIM synchronization service would pick that up through the management agent that's connected to your HR database. Processes the title change and exports this out through through the Active Directory management agent, which updates your AD attributes and which then shows within Office Outlook and in your address book, etc. The FIM synchronization service then also is able to export the change and title and create a new account in your ERP system with the correct uh, roles and responsibilities um, based on on that new role. So basically your HR team has made the change and automatically that has been pushed out to the systems that require that change. And this is all done without any calls to your service desk to, to make any of this happen, which means there's also no um, sort of lead time for, for this happening. It happens automatically straight away. Um, another example of, of the way FIM works is user onboarding. So a new user starts with the company, the user account is created in the HR system. Automatically the FIM synchronization service picks that up through a management agent and based on the, the user's manager and the role given in the HR system, that user account can then be created in whatever systems it, it needs to be. So it could be um, Active Directory, Exchange, um, you know, other line of business applications, that account can be created with the correct roles and, and all the correct information just from that one addition into the HR system. Uh, a similar process happens when a user is, leaves the company. Again, the HR team deactivates the user in the HR system and that kicks off a process which then deactivates the user in all of your other systems. So as Gabe alluded to earlier, when you know if, if you have to have processes to go and deactivate users in multiple different places, it's easy for some something to get missed. So you may have a user that still has access to a system that may be outside of your environment um, just because somebody missed deactivating it. So having this all automated just takes care of a lot of those issues. So just have a look at the um, the FIM portal. So your users would have access to to this portal, and depending on their um, their role within the company, they they would be able to do slightly different things. So in this instance, a user can can create new distribution groups, manage the distribution groups that they are, are the owners of. They can um, request to join a, another distribution group. So it gives the users full control of this and again instead of having to log service desk calls for, for distribution group creation and um, memberships. Um, users can also, if, if they're the owner of a distribution group, can also come here to approve requests and see, see where the requests are at that they've actually sent out themselves. Um, users can edit their profile, which, which is also configurable by administrators. So you can say which parts of a user's profile they're allowed to edit. So they could be allowed to edit their uh, home address or their um, you know, what floor they're working on within a, a building in your company, um, what their phone number is, those sort of things. And that, that's fully configurable to say what, what they can and can't edit. And the, probably the, the big one here is the register for password reset, which allows users, and again, this is fully configurable, to create a number of, of questions with, and answers that they have to answer if they need to reset their password. So you've probably seen this sort of thing on um, many sort of websites where you you sign up for a, a service and you get asked a question like, what is your mother's maiden name? And, and that's the question they're going to ask you if you forget your password. 
Um, with, within FIM, you can set how many questions the user has to answer. You can set how many answers they're allowed to get wrong before they're, they're completely locked out and the password reset will no longer work. Um, so it's, it's quite a powerful tool. And you know, we know coming up to the end of the year now that uh, come the 6th, or I think it is, of January, when a lot of people return from work, our service desks are going to get fairly hammered with requests for password resets um, with by so using this. All, all the people have had such awesome holidays have yeah. completely forgotten their <laughs> completely forgotten their password and all the password. Yeah. So using a system like this, that that um, those volumes of calls to your service desk just just disappear basically. I think it's a really interesting one. You know, certainly working with um, a bunch of service tests over the year. You know, I, I, I mean, I, through my career, yeah, a question I always ask them is, you know, what's the most common um, call that you get through your service desk? And you know, nine times out of ten, it's usually always, you know, password reset. Um, yeah. So, you know, by automating that process, you're going to significantly um, reduce the workload for your your, uh, your call centre. So, um, I, I see it as a major benefit. Yeah. yeah. And that that password reset basically just integrates. Um, into Windows through a plugin, and so when users go to log in, they also have a reset password link, um, which will launch the the questions for them. So yeah, re really easy for users to to set up and use. Um, so moving on from um, Forefront Identity Manager onto Active Directory Federation Services. So. Active Directory Federation Services, or ADFS, is basically Microsoft's implementation of the SAML 2.0 standard for claims-based authentication. Um, ADFS allows you to federate with cloud services such as Office 365, um, SharePoint Online, Dynamic CRM Online, Windows Intune, as well as third-party um, cloud-based applications uh, that, that provide standard SAML 2.0 um, interfaces. So it's not, this, this isn't um, Microsoft only. Um, this also allows for, as, as Gabe alluded to earlier, um, business to business scenarios for federation. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, you, you, you could allow users from another business or another organization to access certain services within your organization um, if you wanted to collaborate with them or, sh or share information between in, uh, those those various organizations. Worth noting as well that um, that uh, ADFS is also being used uh, for government agencies uh, and, and other organizations that are, are um, providing, uh, you yeah, they're doing integrations with Realme as well because you know, uh, Realme is a SAML2 uh, identity provider and uh, and by implementing ADFS um, as a piece of infrastructure within your organisation, you can then use that to broker the uh, the identity transaction between um, your organisation and Realme. So, so <clears throat> the key components that make up um, ADFS are the federation service or the ADFS server itself. Um, the ADFS server provides the the services, including the the trust relationships between federated partners and the issuing of, of the actual claims tokens. Um, this is fronted by a federation service proxy or ADFS proxy, which basically just basically sort of DMZs your, your ADFS server, so you're not having to publish the ADFS server directly on the internet. The proxy server just forwards those takes those requests and forwards them onto your ADFS server. The third component is claims aware applications. So when we're talking about SAML2, the applications that you're going to be accessing using tokens have to be um, claims aware or, or they have to be able to accept SAML2 tokens um, for the most part. However, ADFS does also provide the Windows token based agent um, and the Windows token based agent is uh, basically allows um, web servers that host uh, Windows NT token based application to support
conversion from an ADFS YAML token to an impersonation level Windows NT access token. So this basically allows you to support some legacy applications so long as they, they support um, impersonation level Windows NT access tokens uh, to, to, in a way, support SAML. So just looking at a, a typical ADFS traffic flow example. Um, so here we have two organizations, Contoso.com and Fabricam.com. Um, in this scenario, we have a user from Contoso.com who is accessing a web-based application that is hosted by Fabricam. So the first thing that happens is the user accesses the, the web-based application. The web-based application, because it has this federation trust in place, will automatically redirect the, the client to their local to the, the web servers or Fabricam's local ADFS server. The Fabricam ADFS server, because it has a, a federation trust with an external party, will then base based on the home realm of this user, know that that's, that's the organization they come from and will redirect them to their own ADFS server where they authenticate against their own Active Directory. Their ADFS server then sends them back to the original originating ADFS server where the, the token is um, formed provide it back to the user and present it to the web server, allowing them access and, and authorization. Now, this sounds like a lot of traffic and a lot of things happening. In reality, it's, uh, it's seconds. So from a, user's, yeah, from a user's perspective, uh, they basically are just signing on to an application and, and in some scenarios, if they're inside their internal network, they, they won't, they'll, they'll just get straight in um, using their, their credentials they already have. And so it's, um, it's all using browser or redirects and happens very rapidly. Um, yeah. So. yeah. I mean, the user would have to be um, really, really watching their browser to actually see these redirects take place. Um, so, and yes, if the user is sitting within there, has logged in to their domain first, uh, this can be fully configured to just be completely seamless where they won't be prompted for a username and password at all. Um, it, it's already trusted. So moving on from Active Directory Federation services, I'm just going to take a look at Windows Azure AD or Windows Azure Active Directory. So Windows Azure AD basically provides you cloud-based um, Active Directory. And there's a number of scenarios that this can be used in. So in the first scenario, is kind of a, a, a traditional um, hosted environment type scenario where you have stood up your own uh, virtual machines on the Windows Azure platform. Um, say you might be hosting uh, your, your SharePoint um, farm within Azure instead of in, within your own network. And in this scenario, you can actually stand up um, fully functional Active Directory servers as VMs using a virtual private network to link these to your local Active Directory domain controllers and basically setting up a, a secondary site. So for all intents and purposes, Azure, the Azure VMs become like a, a branch office of, of your uh, main office. So where this might be used is, as I said, for SharePoint, which requires quite a heavy integration with Active Directory, this would mean that the only traffic, Active Directory traffic traversing the internet is replication traffic, which can be um, controlled quite easily as far as, you know, when does that replication happen and how much um, bandwidth it uses, et cetera, instead of having uh, your Azure-based um, SharePoint just constantly um, having to access your local Active Directory. So it's just moving that, that traffic out from your local LAN. So in the second um, 
scenarios for Windows Azure Active Directory. This is where you actually base either all of your Active Directory in Azure or um, parts of it. So, and you're accessing um, software as a service type applications. So, in the first scenario here, a sole directory, say if you have an organization that doesn't have um, their own Active Directory, or you have users that you want to be able to use a, a SaaS application that you don't want federated with your local Active Directory, so you don't mind the fact that they're going to have to use a separate username and password. So in this instance, the user would access the SaaS application, um, be redirected to authenticate against the Azure Active Directory instance, which, which is basically a multi-tenanted um, instance of Active Directory hosted within the Azure platform, uh, they were given a, a token, much like ADFS, and that token then allows them access to the application. Uh, the application can also then query Windows Azure Active Directory directly um, using the, the graph API for extra attributes. So if, if you needed to know um, you know, the user's address or a, a group membership or something like that. So I imagine this um, that scenario would be quite appealing for small organisations that don't really want to have a lot of um, infrastructure, particularly new organisations that don't you know see the need to have on-premise server infrastructure. Yeah, um, exactly. And that this, so you know uh, where this might come into effect is a, a small business, which New Zealand is you know very well known as as many small businesses. Um, it means they don't need to have their Active Directory infrastructure anymore. Or, you know, if you're using something like Office 365, um, you know, your your mail, your um, documents, everything are, are held here in the cloud. So there's no real reason to have that AD infrastructure anymore within that small business. They can just push it all out to Azure Active Directory and manage it from there. Um, in the second scenario, for a larger organization that has their own Active Directory but is using SaaS based applications, um, for example, Office 365, um, we can actually synchronize some of those attributes from the local Active Directory into Azure Active Directory using a tool called Dersync. So this might be, in the case of Office 365, your distribution group memberships for Exchange um, and the user IDs and um, recently, also, you can sync your passwords. Um, this, in conjunction with ADFS for federated single sign-on, makes for a, a very easy solution for your users in that they, they get the single sign-on where they don't need to log in again to access the cloud-based solution. Um, and the cloud-based solution is able to query for things like the distribution group memberships without having to have any access back into your local Active Directory. So th <coughs> the last scenario here is um, using Azure Active Directory access control. So what this does is opens Azure Active Directory up to other identity providers or IDPs. So this could be things like your Gmail, Google account, um, Yahoo accounts, Facebook, um, other, so Microsoft Live ID, pretty much any other identity provider, um, you know, can, can hook into this. So the way this works is you, if you have a, a cloud-based application or an application you're hosting, um, you, you can say, we'll accept uh, Facebook logins, for instance. And instead of having to develop your application to be able to use Facebook as a logon, you can push that, that work off to Azure Active Directory access control. So user logs in using their Facebook account. Uh, they returned a, a token, which is then sent to Azure Active Directory access control, where it's transformed to to be the type of 
token claim that your your application is actually expecting. So whether the, the user uses a Google account, uh, a Facebook account, or, or whatever, the token that your application sees is always going to be in the same format. So your developers aren't having to um, develop for you know half a dozen different identity providers. They're only having to develop for Azure Active Directory, and the access control component takes care of transforming the other identity providers' um, claims to, to match what the application requires. So pretty pretty powerful stuff, especially if, if you're an organization that's wanting to open um, applications up to the, the public. Um, and again, you know, the real me, if it's sensitive information, if it's not so sensitive, um, then something like this where you can allow users to you know, use something like their Facebook account, which you, know, you, you see this all over the internet these days where you know, if you sign up for a, a Spotify account, you can log in with your Facebook account. You know, there's, there's many services doing this now. So, so users out there in the public are, are used to this way of doing things. So that covers the tools. Um, Thanks. Um, yeah, so in summary, you know, identity management is, is really important and it's becoming, uh, you know, more important as time goes on, you know, uh, with, the, with the kind of cloud-based services, this is really um, bringing it, bring it to, the, to, the, to the forefront, uh, to, to use a uh, Microsoft product name. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know, and, and, and obviously, you know, people want um, to be able to reduce that number of digital identities that they're, they're managing and, and, you know, by, by providing this kind of federated style solutions, that, that, that's going to really um, help that, uh, particularly from an organization's perspective. Um, New Zealand has a number of identity you know, management solutions um, already going on, and, and so I hope we've kind of made you sort of aware of uh, some of what's going on. And uh, yeah, so so really, uh, you know, it, it, the these sort of identity projects really need to be treated as a, a you know base infrastructure kind of concern. It's not just um, something you really want to tack on to an application to a project that you're doing, uh, say delivering a new application. You know, ideally speaking, it should be treated uh, with just as much um, sort of uh, Management and planning, um, as any sort of Active Directory or, or you know core sort of um, security project or infrastructure project um, for your organisation. Um, yeah. So as we're saying, you know, Microsoft offers a number of tools for managing uh, our internal identities, um, both on premise and in the cloud, including uh, ADFS, Forefront Identity Manager, and Azure AD. And as Gabe was was just alluding to. Um, with all these different options available for managing identity, it is important that organisations spend time and plan along with any requirements to ensure that whatever solutions are being put in place are scalable and allow the option to extend their identity beyond the organisation later. So, you know, an organisation at the moment might be thinking, hey, you know, we're not using any cloud services, so we don't need to to think about um, you know pushing our identity out into the cloud. But that may not be the case for you know for the long term future. So it's it's good to start thinking about these things um, so that you you don't sort of build yourself into a hole 